As discussed in other videos, choosing the right memory cards is increasingly important as the performance of our cameras and the cards themselves are increasing. Getting it wrong can be a costly mistake, especially when you're looking at CF Express cards, where the latest version 4.0 cards cost upwards of $1,500 a piece. After getting my Nikon Z8 and a bit of testing, I think I may have found a couple of cards that fit the bill. In my video on CF Express cards, I highlighted the need to consider both read and write performance and thermal performance. And in this video, we'll look at those and we'll also overlay cost, both per gigabyte and the absolute cost of the cards. I'm going to do this video in slight reverse order and tell you the two cards up front and then run through the logic. So the two cards are the ProGrade Cobalt 165GB card and the Delkin Power G4 um, range of cards from 650GB up to 2TB. What I'm going to do in this video is run through their specs, their performance for stills, their performance for video and their cost. And then at the end we'll come back to why you might choose one over the other. And stick around to the end because there I'll tell you about a little easter egg you might be lucky enough to find in one of these cards. So let's start with specifications and the ProGrade Cobalt card. The Cobalt line is ProGrade's high performance line and we're looking at the one that is the 2.0 line, the one that uses the Compact Flash Express version 2.0 standard. They do now have a version 4.0 line, but that's really aimed at specialist video cameras, such as the Canon EOS C and the Red V Raptor. So coming back to that Cobalt version 2.0, the maximum read speed is 1700 megabits per second, and the maximum write speed is 1500 megabits per second, so pretty good. The minimum sustained write speed which they publish is 1400 megabits per second, and these figures are the same for all capacity cards in this range. This range uses the PCIe 3.0 standard and the NVMe 1.3 standard. Interestingly, ProGrade also provide a um, piece of software called Refresh Pro, which is about monitoring the life of your card and sanitizing the card. This is an extra cost though, and the cards come with a three-year warranty. Now, if you go to the Nikon manual, you'll see that ProGrade cards are recommended in the Z8 manual. Um, but if you go to the Nikon US site where there is a more detailed list of individual cards, only the ProGrade Cobalt 325GB and 650GB are listed. Now in talking to ProGrade, this is probably because Nikon haven't tested the 165GB card yet. So moving on to the Delkin Power G4 and specifically the 650GB up to 2TB range, Delkin's power line sit beneath their high performance line, the black line. With the new G4 line, and you have to make sure you're buying the G4 version, the generation 4 version, they have a higher performance than the previous versions. However, different capacity cards have different performance levels, and that's why I say look at the 650 gigabyte versus 2 terabyte. The 128 gigabyte to 512 gigabyte cards have a minimum sustained write speed of 805 megabits per second, but the 650 gigabyte up to 2 terabyte cards have a minimum sustained write speed of 1490 megabits per second, which is much higher and very close to the 1560 megabits per second of the black range. For these higher capacity cards, the maximum read speed is 1780 megabits per second and the maximum write speed is 1700 megabits per second. As with the ProGrade Cobalt card, these cards use the PCIe 3.0 standard, but they use the NVMe 1.4 standard for the NVMe controller. They come with a lifetime warranty, and whilst not currently on the Nikon recommended list, Delkin do say on their website they have been tested with the Z8 and the Z9. So as you see, they're reasonably comparable cards from a performance perspective and should be a high enough performing cards for anything the Z8 can throw at them. But how do they perform in the real world? 
Let's start with stills photography. And as you'll see from the figures, from a capacity perspective, both cards should be more than enough for most people, whether shooting lossless RAW, RAW high efficiency STAR or JPEG. As we've discussed in other videos, it's no longer just about capacity though. Shooting 20 frames per second lossless RAW produces somewhere just over a thousand megabits per second. And that's where these cards minimum sustained write speeds are important. At 1400 and 1490 megabits per second respectively, both should have significant headroom. If you've watched my other videos, you'll know that with the ProGrade card, the maximum um, write speed was actually around 893 megabits per second with that high burst rate shooting in lossless RAW. Well interestingly within a tolerance Delkin's performance is pretty much identical to the ProGrade card which indicates that the likely bottleneck that causes the camera to buffer after three to four seconds with both cards is actually the buffer memory in camera rather than the card as potentially it's having to write and read to that buffer memory at the same time. So as you can see, even in high burst rates, these cards are more than capable, which means they'll be more than capable for the vast majority of photography uses and use cases. So now let's double click on video and start with a quick look at capacity. The figures here come from what the camera display shows as being available on each card or the Nikon manual if necessary. Interestingly, particularly with H.265 and 4K, I'm finding that the bit rates I'm experiencing in the real world are much better than the manual or the camera indicates. Um, I'm gonna to have to do some more digging into this um, to see what's going on, but it would indicate in the real world you can actually achieve much higher um, levels of video recorded to these cards, potentially in H.265 and 4K. As we talked about in the specification, both cards are capable of recording in any format on the Z8 and cope with 8K NRAW at 60 frames per second in high quality, which creates about a 723 megabits per second data flow. It's therefore capacity and thermal performance that are really important in the context of video. So what I've done in relation to this is run a series of real world type tests for the cards. They were all done at about 20 degrees C ambient temperature with the card door closed on the camera using an external power source. The screen was pulled away from the back of the camera for each test, the camera was started from a cold condition. I let it cool down in between each of the tests. The camera was running firmware 1.01. Now this is a video predominantly aimed at the cards rather than the performance of the camera. And therefore in the real world, the way we would operate with cards is that if we were recording video and we filled up a card, we would probably either put a new card in, which would start from cold, even though the camera would be slightly hotter, or we would perhaps take the card out, remove the data, the videos onto a computer and put that same card back in and reformat it. But the card will have cooled down, the camera will have had time to cool down. So I've been considering these tests to be complete once a card is full. However, a couple of times I have reformatted the card to see how long it would go before the camera gave a hot warning on the display also out of interest. So let's start by looking at my particular use case. I tend to use most 8K H.265 10-bit video shooting at 24 frames per second. If we look at the figures here for the Cobalt 165 gigabyte um, card, now this has a capacity of 45 minutes in this, um, in that capacity. Now we did get a hot card reading after about 19 minutes. However, I could fill that card without any further warnings. I did reformat it and carry on for a second 45 minute video just to see when a, any hot camera warning would come up. And we did get one after about 57 minutes, but we never got a red hot camera warning. 
Now if we look at the Delkin, which has a much larger capacity here, the camera has a cap of two hours, five minutes, 125 minutes. I got again a hot card warning at 19 minutes. I got a yellow hot camera warning at 69 minutes, but then even restarting the recording when the camera interrupted at 125 minutes, I could record to the capacity of the card without getting any red hot camera warnings. As I said, these tests were carried out with firmware 1.01 in the camera. And in this firmware, Nikon tweaked the temperature thresholds for the warnings that come on the LCD and in the EVF. My experience is that these tweaks have given me about 20% longer to the hot card warning with the Delkin and about 40% longer to the yellow hot camera warning with the Delkin. And in both cases, um, the red hot camera warning hasn't come on at all. So as you can see, using H.265, even shooting at 8K, both cards give a really good solid performance. So let's now notch it up a level and go to 8K NRAW 12-bit at 60 frames per second. That codec that creates about 723 megabits per second of data. Now, I haven't tested the ProGrade here because at 160 gigabytes, it only records uh, just under four minutes of footage. I can tell you I didn't get any hot card warnings um, or hot camera warnings in that time. So it really isn't a massively relevant test. With the Delkin, however, you can record up to about 23 uh, minutes maximum with the one terabyte card. And as you'll see from the figures, I did get a hot card warning again at about 18 minutes, so not too dissimilar from the H.265 test. I didn't get any further warnings in the 23 minutes recording available. I did reformat the card and carry on, and it took another 15 minutes, so a total of 33 minutes recording before I got a yellow hot camera warning. As you can see, within the capacity constraints of each card, with neither card did the camera stop recording due to heat. This is important because we need to consider the effect of heat on the card's performance. CF Express cards contain temperature sensors on the card, and one of the functions of the NVMe controller is to ensure that the card isn't damaged by heat. And it does this through thermal throttling, reducing the data flow if the card gets too hot. Whilst both cards may have throttled during the test due to their temperatures, there was enough headroom between the camera's bandwidth requirement and the minimum sustained write speed for them to carry on performing. What I've experienced on lesser cards is that once it gets hot, then the video is interrupted by the card write speed dropping below that which is required and the video stops recording. And neither of these cards did that, even with the high bandwidth intensive 8K NRAW at 60 frames per second. So as you can see, as with stills photography, with video, both of these cards, within their constraints of capacity, are able to perform at a really high level. But performance does, I'm afraid, come at a cost, and especially here in the UK. The figures on the screen here are the purchase costs um, available as of today from reputable approved dealers. The UK ones do obviously include VAT or sales tax and the US ones exclude sales tax. It's equally important to look at the cost of the cards as a cost per gigabyte. And here you can start to see some big benefits if you can stretch yourself to that larger card if you need it. This isn't intended to be a head-to-head, -head, as I would have had to have looked at the Cobalt 650 gigabyte card rather than the 165 gigabyte card. And that retails at about $770 or $1.18 per gigabyte. So this really was about looking at different cards for different use cases. So let's consider the scenarios when each of the cards has its moment in the spotlight. If perhaps you primarily shoot stills and want to be able to use that burst shooting 
um, capability of the Z8 and perhaps want to shoot a little bit of video, perhaps a H.265 in either 8K or 4K, then the ProGrade 165 gigabyte card will have enough capacity for most of your situations and come in at a lower absolute cost. If, however, you shoot high burst rate a lot, for example, for sport and don't want the risk of missing something while changing cards, or you shoot a lot of video and want to capture significant H.265 in either 8K or 4K, or perhaps you want to capture in NRAW video, then the Delkin with its higher capacity may be a great card for you. It may not have the ruggedness of the black line or the 48 hour replacement that that comes with, but it has a very attractive price per gigabyte. So I mentioned at the beginning a little Easter egg you may be lucky enough to find in one of these cards. Now when I bought my Delkin card from Delkin, it was advertised as a 650 gigabyte card and I paid the price for a 650 gigabyte card. However, when I plugged it into my card reader, it shows up as a one terabyte card, not a 650 gigabyte card. And I tested, I can actually record up to a 950 gigabyte video to it. So I reached out to Delkin and they kindly explained that if they feel they're going to be out of stock of a particular type of card for a significant period, then rather than disappoint people, they sometimes use a larger card that has a, um, that matches or exceeds the spec of the label that they're going to put on the card. So my 650 gigabyte card is actually a one terabyte card with a 650 gigabyte label on it. So you may be lucky like me and pay for a 650 gigabyte card and get a higher capacity. So this did cause me a few conundrums in creating this video. Did I refer to it as a 650 gigabyte card or did I refer to it as a one terabyte card? I believe the performance is broadly similar across the two cards other than the capacity. So what I did was I've done the technical tests as a one terabyte card but looked at the economics as the 650 gigabyte card because that's what I thought I was purchasing, that was the price I paid. So I hope this makes sense and as always it'd be great to hear your use cases in the comments below. What cards are you using and how are they measuring up? And as always it'd be great to see you on a future video.